There we go. And uh, again, welcome to the LA Burgers presentation for our webinar for May 10th. Uh, we have Whitney Tsai Nakashima with us. And if you're not a member of LA Burgers yet, I would like to urge you to become a member or make a donation at our website at laburgers.org. We, with your help, we can present these webinars, our science projects, and other other things that LA Burgers really appreciate it. Really appreciate. And with that, I'd like to ask Susan to introduce our speaker for tonight. Susan. Thank you, Ron. Well, it's our great pleasure to have Whitney Sai Nakashima present to Los Angeles Birders tonight. If you've ever visited the Moore Lab of Zoology at Occidental College, you may have already met Whitney. Whitney began working in museum collections as the lab manager at the Moore Laboratory in 2012. And today, Whitney continues collection-based work as the curatorial assistant in the Dickey Collection at UCLA, where she is a PhD candidate in ecology and evolutionary biology department. Whitney's graduate work focuses on using historical museum collections and modern genomic and analytic techniques to better understand the evolutionary processes that generate and maintain avian diversity. So please welcome Whitney Sai Nakashima. Thank you so much, Susan, for that introduction. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. How does that look to everyone? Good. Very nice. Great. Looks great. Um, well, thank you so much for everyone um, for tuning in today and um, to the LA Birders organizers uh, for inviting me here. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you today about some of the work that I'm doing on the evolution of visual system and color diversity in birds. And so from this really amazing collage of photos, and I'm sure from all of the amazing birds that you have all seen, we know that birds display a really amazing diversity of colors and patterns. And these colors really seem to span the entire rainbow. Um, and before we kind of really dive into bird coloration specifically, we should probably talk a little bit about color itself. Um, so in order for us to see color, we really need light. And light is made up of all the colors of the color spectrum or all the colors of the rainbow. Um, and when we can, and we can visualize this by looking at light hitting a prism. So when light from some source, say either the sun or from a light bulb or a flashlight, when it hits a prism, it's separated so that we can actually see each of its individual colors. And we know that light travels in wavelengths of different sizes and each wavelength is associated with a different color. And so here we can see that red travels in really long wavelengths, um, which is indicated by the distance between the peaks here, while violet travels in shorter wavelengths. And so when we see color, we are really seeing just the wavelengths of light that are being reflected off the surface of that object. For example, take this red ball. It absorbs all wavelengths of light except for red. So what we see is just the red light being reflected off the surface of the image. In a similar way, an orange object um, will absorb all wavelengths except orange, and so it reflects orange, and that's what we see, and so on for all of the other colors of the rainbow. Um, black and white are actually slightly different. Um, the color black actually absorbs all wavelengths of light, and white reflects all wavelengths of light. And so color is really just the product of light being differentially reflected and absorbed um, by the surface of an object. And so going back to the birds and their incredible coloration, all of these diverse colors of bird plumage and feathers um, has really fascinated biologists for over a century. And because of this fascination, we really know quite a lot about the colors that birds produce and how they're producing these colors. And so birds can produce color in two main ways. And one of these ways is by depositing pigments into their developing feathers. And so pigments are really just chemical compounds that selectively absorb and reflect certain wavelengths of light. And depending on the specific pigment, they can either be synthesized by the bird itself or obtained from their diet. And so one of the main pigment classes in birds is called melanin pigment pigments. 
and melanins can be synthesized by birds. And these pigments are responsible for most of the blacks, browns, grays, and rufous colors that we see in birds. Um, and melanin is also really important in uh, patterning in birds. So any of the really striking patterns that we see in birds like quails and turkey is due to actually the differential expression of melanin across the feather during development, which is why we can see a lot of these really intense streaking and scaling patterns in birds. We also know that melanin pigments are really structurally robust. So when they are present in feathers, they can add structural integrity. And because of this structural integrity, the wings and the tips of flight feathers and a lot of species tend to be pretty dark because of the deposition of melanin into those feathers. So you may notice that many mostly white birds like gulls often have these dark wingtips. And the melanin in these wingtips helps resist abrasion and wearing in these really heavily used feathers. We also know that structural integrity of melanin can um, has been shown to function in parasite resistance, particularly against things like feather lice, which actually feed on the feathers and can be responsible for early breakage. Another really common class of pigments in birds are the carotenoid pigments. So carotenoids produce reds, yellows, and oranges in birds' feathers. Um, and many plants produce carotenoids, but carotenoids can't actually be synthesized by birds on their own. So instead, what birds need to do is actually obtain these carotenoids from their diet by eating either plants or plant products with carotenoids in them. And then once they've obtained those carotenoids, they can deposit them into their feathers either directly or after um, some enzymatic modification to slightly change the color and then deposit those into their feathers. And in order for birds to actually produce this highly saturated carotenoid based colors, birds must consume more carotenoids than are actually present in a normal diet. And so the more carotenoids that birds consume, the brighter their plumage could be. So for example, the bright uh, red plumage of house finches is linked to the ability of the bird to actually acquire carotenoids from the environment. And thus it's hypothesized that the brightness of the red of house finches is actually an honest indicator of the fitness of that bird, showing that they are able to acquire lots of carotenoids and advertising that they're in a healthy body condition. And while most birds use carotenoids to make red, yellow, and orange, parrots actually have their own special pigment to produce these colors. These pigments are called cytocofulvins and they are unique to parrots. And studies have shown that even though parrots can actually acquire carotenoids, they are actually not using those in their feathers for colorations. Instead, they're using these cytocofulvins to make these colors reds, yellows, and oranges. Another unique set of pigments are the taurosin and turricoverdin that are only found in turricos. Taurosin um, produces the red coloration found in some turricos and Turcoverdin produces the green. And one kind of interesting thing about these pigments in turacos is that they are actually copper-based pigments. And turacos live across the central African uh, plains and they um, is actually one of the world's richest copper belts. And they actually obtain a lot of copper from their diet of fruits, flowers, and buds. Um, and copper can be pretty damaging to birds if it's accumulated at high concentrations. And so it's possible that these unique pigments are a way to actually detoxify high levels of copper by depositing them into their feathers. And as far as we know, turricoverdin is actually the only green pigment that is found in birds. All of the other greens that we see in birds are a combination of carotenoid pigments and another form of color production called structural coloration that I'll talk about next. And so the other main way that birds produce color is the, by structural coloration. And structural coloration is produced by varying the composition of pigments and proteins in bird feathers. In this way, light interacts with both the cellular structure of the feather and the underlying pigments to reflect different colors. And variation in these microstructures can produce a whole range of different colors. <clears throat> 
Um, and for example, blue is a structural color found in birds. And to our knowledge, we don't have, we don't know of any blue pigments in bird feathers. And so any bird that we see that's blue, um, that feather plumage is produced by structural coloration. And in this example of a bunting, here, this is a cross section of a part of the feather. And we see that there's this outer keratin protein layer that's on top of a spongy layer made of proteins and air vacuoles, and then a layer of black melanin underneath that. And so when the light hits this feather, it absorbs all wavelengths of light except for blue, which is why we see that this bunting is um, as blue and not even though it doesn't have any blue pigment. And structural coloration can also make iridescent colors like those of hummingbirds. So here we see kind of a different feather microstructure. Um, this hummingbird feather shows multiple layers of melanin in these rod-like structures uh, interspersed with multiple layers of keratin. And so when light hits this microstructure, it actually reflects different colors depending on the viewing angle. And this is similar to how light is kind of reflected off of mineral rocks like diamonds or quartz. When you, and when you look at these from different angles, you might see different colors. And so these are just two examples of how varying feather microstructure can produce two very different colors. And so in addition to blues and iridescent colors, structural coloration can produce most of the greens, purples, and any glossy or shiny colors in birds. It can also produce these really intense blacks called super blacks that are found in some birds of paradise and Ramphacelus tanagers, and these blacks actually absorb even more wavelengths of light than um, just your normal kind of melanin black. And some, um, structure, some whites are actually also produced by structural coloration, like the winter white of this rock ptarmigan, um, while other whites are actually just produced from a lack of pigment. And we know that birds are also capable of producing colors that actually reflect ultraviolet spectrum, and these colors are produced by structural coloration as well. And although we can't see these UV signatures with our bare eyes, we can actually see evidence of this UV coloration under black light or by using UV photography. And we know from studies of bird vision and behavior that birds are actually capable of seeing these UV colors as well. And so just to give you a little bit of background on UV vision and vertebrates, we know that the ability to see UV isn't limited to just birds. And in fact, many fish, amphibians, reptiles, and even some mammals have the, have the ability to see UV. And although the vertebrate visual process is really highly conserved, the pathway to UV vision differs in non-avian vertebrates than in birds. Um, and this kind of points toward an independent origin of UV vision in birds. And so just a quick overview of avian color vision. Um, here is a diagram of an avian eye, and you'll notice that it looks fairly similar to our eyes. And like us, bird eyes use a cornea and a lens to focus and filter light onto the back of the eye. Um, and this back part of the eye is known as the retina. And within this retina, there are two types of photoreceptor cells. And these photoreceptors are called rod cells and cone cells. And so the rod cells here are these elongated gray cells um, in this diagram. And the cone cells are the multicolor cells with the cone shape on the top. And rods we know detect dim light and function mostly in motion sensing and peripheral and night vision. Whereas the cones detect bright light and are actually important for color vision and kind of what we'll be focusing on for this presentation. And we know that each cone type is sensitive to a different wavelength of light, and each cone has an associated visual pigment that's important in determining the sensitivity to different wavelengths of light. And so birds have four different single cone types in their retinas. And these cone types are sensitive to wavelengths loosely associated with the colors red, blue, green, and UV. And when we compare bird vision to human vision, we see that birds have actually an expanded color vision from our own. And this is because we have only three single cone types in our eyes with peak sensitivities associated with red, green, and blue. So the additional fourth cone type in the eyes of bird really 
birds and really enhances their color vision. So instead of just having three different color filters, they actually have four color filters, which enables them to see into this UV range of the color spectrum. And so we can't really know exactly what birds see when they view the world, but we can try to interpret the differences from our vision. So if we take this image of a red-legged honeycreeper specimen, this photo was taken in the human visible spectrum, and this is what we can see when we see the bird. But when we consider bird vision, we must also really consider the UV colors that they are producing. And so by taking an image using UV photography, we can actually see which parts of the bird reflect um, in the UV. And so in this image, we see that the bright patches on the bird are reflecting uh, UV. And because of that four single cone type in their eyes, birds can see UV in addition to all of the colors that we can see. And there have been attempts to try to kind of visualize what birds might be seeing by overlaying human visible light photos with UV images. Um, and the potential product of these images might look something like this. So it looks pretty different than what we're just seeing um, under human visible light. However, it's really important to remember that this is just kind of a representation of how birds might be seeing differently than we do. We can't really actually know what birds are seeing um, in their perception. And so here's just another look at those peak sensitivities of those four single cones in the eyes of birds. And so we know that these peak sensitivities actually are not static and that different species of birds may have slightly different peak sensitivities in their cone reception receptors. We also know that this UV cone can actually uh, vary pretty widely in its peak sensitivity and it can vary so much that it can actually move inside and outside of that UV range. So a bird with a UV cone peak within the UV spectrum is known to have a high ultraviolet sensitivity or a high UVS. While a bird with a peak sensitivity um, outside of the UV spectrum is known to have a low UV sensitivity or low UVS. Um, and so for the remainder of this talk, I will be referring to these as high and low ultraviolet sensitivity or UVS visual systems. And from prior research, we know that we can actually predict whether a bird has a high UVS visual system or a low UVS visual system by looking at the DNA um, of the DNA sequence of the SWS1 opsin. And this is the visual pigment that's associated with the UV cone. And so it's um, helps determine what the peak sensitivity of that cone is. And recent advances in DNA sequencing technology have really made it possible to sequence the full genetic information of birds at a fairly cheap price and with relative ease. And because of this, we have access to a ton of genetic information and we can sort through it to find this single SWS1 sequence for all different kinds of birds. And being able to predict the visual system sensitivity of bird species based on a single sequence is a really powerful tool that wouldn't have been possible just a couple decades ago. And now we can use this tool to really investigate the evolution of visual system and color in birds across the entire tree of life. And so there are a variety of hypotheses why color and the visual system in birds have evolved. Um, and we know that plumage coloration can be important in both sexual and social signaling. Um, in particular, we know that UV reflecting plumage can allow for signaling between conspecifics while excluding predators who may not have that UV vision. UV color has also um, been shown to play an important role in mate choice. And we also have found out that light environment or habitat may be important in the evolution of color and visual system in birds. Plumage coloration can be um, useful for things like camouflage. And while for some birds, camouflage will mean being colored brown like this Western screech owl, for other birds like parrots that are often found really high in leafy green trees, camouflage might mean being colored green, this really bright green to match their background. Also, we know that many leaf surfaces reflect ultraviolet, 
and that in addition and that in addition to varying amounts of sunlight that penetrates through the forest canopy makes for a pretty complex visual environment. So it's possible that having a high UVS visual system could help birds navigate better through these complex visual environments. Foraging may be another thing driving the evolution of color and visual system in birds. We know that many fruits have a waxy surface that reflects UV. And so birds with a high UVS visual system may be able to find fruits in complex environments. Um, additionally, we know that some small rodents leave urine tracts that reflect UV, and so it could be helpful for some predators to have high UVS visual system as well. Lastly, one of the things that birds must balance with having a high UVS visual system is the risk of photo damage to their retina. We know that UV rays can cause damage to the retina, both in birds and in humans. Um, our eyes do a fairly good job at filtering out UV before that light hits our retina um, because of the uh, fluid in our lens, but we still have to be careful and wear sunglasses and not look directly at the sun. In birds, especially in long-lived birds or birds in certain types of environments, like really open environments or in aquatic environments, maybe at particular risk for photo damage and must have some way to balance the benefits of having a high UVS visual system and the risk of photo damage. And so in order to really tease apart these hypotheses, we first need to know the evolutionary history of the visual system sensitivity across the bird tree of life. And by evolutionary history, I mean which bird species have evolved a high ultraviolet sensitive visual system and which species have evolved a low ultraviolet sensitive visual system. And so to do this, we gathered sequences from previous studies and a number of online genetic repositories. And we ended up with sequences of um, the SWS1 opsin for 154 bird species kind of spread across the entire bird tree of life. And we predicted whether each species had a high UVS visual system or a low UVS visual system. And so here is a phylogenetic tree of the birds in our analysis. And this tree is really just a representation of how birds are related to each other. And each tip of this tree represents a different species. So birds that are more closely related to each other are on kind of similar branches of this tree. So from this branch going out, these two birds are pretty closely related. Um, and birds that are more distantly related are on kind of different branches that are further spread out. So if you follow all of these branching, this bird over here is pretty distantly related to this other bird over here. And the color of the tip corresponds to the visual system sensitivity. So the blue tips are species with a high UVS visual system, and the red tips are the species with a low UVS visual system. And what you'll notice is that most of these really long branches of the tree are red. And, but as you kind of make your way towards the, uh, the tips of this tree, you'll notice that, that we see some blue popping up in these isolated sections of the tree. And this tells us that a high ultraviolet sensitive visual system has evolved multiple times in the evolutionary history of birds. And even though our phylogenetic tree does not include every one of the 10,000 plus species of birds, we can still pretty confidently say that the UVS visual system has evolved independently at least 12 times in birds based on our tree. And so when we look more closely at some of the groups um, where we see UVS visual system evolving, uh, UVS appears to be pretty common in, goal, in the family of goals, Larity. Uh, we also see UVS in trogons and uh, motmots and in parrots. And next we'll look at kind of this entire group called the passeriformes, which is the order that contains all of the perching birds or songbirds, and it makes up more than half of all bird um, species. And this order is broken up into kind of two main groups. So we have the sub which contain groups like flycatchers, and the ossines, which contain most of the diversity in passeriformes. 
And we see that UVS um, evolved just once in the sub ossines and a few times within the ossines. And then within the ossines, we see that UVS visual system seems to be pretty ubiquitous in this entire infraorder passerides right here. And this group includes uh, groups like the tanagers, the cardinals, and the warblers. And these results are pretty consistent with uh, previous results as well. And so in the next few slides, I'll kind of um, come back to some of these groups and explain some of the interesting findings. So we find that gulls and skimmers have this high UVS visual system. And I think this is somewhat surprising because of their um, kind of shore and aquatic habitats. You might think that they would be a little bit um, prone to photo damage. However, one thing that could be driving the evolution of this visual system in these birds is that their prey items are fish. And fish can actually see um, both C and signal in UV. And thus having a high UVS visual system may help them um, foraging for fish near the surface of the water. However, further investigation into gull vision and foraging behavior and potentially their ability to um, counteract photo damage is really needed to determine if this is an, indeed an adaptation for foraging. We also found that many raptors have a low UVS visual system. And as I mentioned before, um, some birds may be pretty prone to photo damage and it's hypothesized that high aerial predators like raptors are at a higher risk of photo damage. And thus having a low UVS visual system might be necessary to avoid damage to the retina. We also know from previous studies that um, raptors actually have lenses that um, block a lot of UV transmittance to the retina, which may also help them to avoid that photo damage. We've also found a low UVS visual system in swifts, which also spend much of their time flying high in the air. Um, another interesting thing that we found was that we found a high UVS visual system in parrots. Um, and we know that parrots are really long lived and that their um, potential for photo damage may be quite high. But we also know that parrots actually produce um, ultraviolet colors and it could be important for their signaling. Parrots are also um, frugivores and so they forage on a lot of fruits. And so having a UVS visual system may um, help them for uh, finding fruits um, and foraging. Um, one way that the parrots actually might be able to kind of resist the uh, photo damage is that they have carotenoids um, both in their eyes and also in their blood. And carotenoids are actually known to be pretty effective antioxidants and immunostimulants. And it's possible that um, parrots use these carotenoids to avoid their photo damage. Um, and as we learned at the beginning of this talk, parrots produce a really special pigment called citicofulvin, which is only present in parrots and it produces red, orange, and yellow. So it's possible that by having this unique pigment, they are able to conserve carotenoids in their bodies from their diet to use as antioxidants um, instead of depositing them in their feathers. We also see that in the passerides, the UVS visual system is pretty ubiquitous across this entire infraorder. And UVS visual system in this group could have a number of functions. Um, it could help with foraging for berries and other fruits. It could also help with signaling um, and be able, being able to make these kind of cryptic signals to conspecifics. Many of these species live in forest habitats and many of their predators um, may not have a UV vision. And so being able to signal to each other, um, but hidden from predators um, could be important. Um, and lastly, we found that obtaining a full SWS1 sequence from hummingbirds birds has proven really difficult. Um, and we've also seen this with previous studies. 
We only know of one study that has um, been able to recover a partial SWS1 sequence, and we've been able to predict the um, high UVS versus low UVS visual system from. And from that partial sequence, we found that hummingbirds have a low UVS uh, visual system, which is surprising because we know from behavioral studies that um, hummingbirds can actually distinguish UV colors really, really well. Um, they can distinguish between UV and non-UV colors. They can also distinguish between colors that are mixed. So UV plus red versus UV plus blue. And there are a couple possible reasons um, for why the SWS1 opsin might not match with their actual visual system. Um, it may be that the SWS opsin is just really hard to sequence in hummingbirds, but another interesting hypothesis could be that hummingbirds are actually lacking this opsin and that the, their pathway to ultraviolet might be different from a lot of different birds. We know that hummingbirds are kind of um, in this group of birds that are nocturnal. So they're related to things like night jars um, and those are all nocturnal birds. And so it's possible that the, in their evolutionary history, they lost the SWS1 opsin, and then they've evolved a unique way to be able to see um, UV. So now that we kind of have a better understanding of the evolutionary history of the visual system sensitivity in birds, our next step is really to determine which colors birds are producing. And so the way that we're doing this is by making 3D digital models of museum specimens in both the human visible spectrum and the UV spectrum. And so here's an example of some of the 3D images um, that we have made of tanagers. And from these models, we can determine which colors the birds are producing. And once we know which colors birds are producing, we can put this together with the visual system sensitivity of birds to be able to really test this kind of signaling hypothesis. So specifically, we can ask whether birds that are producing UV colors have a high UV sensitive visual system. And we can also use information that we know about the color producing mechanisms to ask similar questions about if specific color producing mechanisms are associated with visual system sensitivity. And this part of the work is still in progress um, as we are currently making these models and determining colors from these models. So you'll have to stay tuned for more results. And with that, I would really just like to thank you all for tuning in. Um, I have a ton of collaborators and funding sources to thank as well. And I will take any questions or comments. Well, thank you very much, Whitney. That was wonderful. And uh, if you have any questions, um, please use the Q&A down at the bottom of your screen. That kind of helps us keep track of everything. And uh, Mark, there's a question that came up in, in the chat. I think we might have lost. Oh, him. sorry. I was, oh. I was still muted. Oh. I thought <laughs> that's what no 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 you didn't lose me I was just muted and I forgot to unmute um, so Lance asks um, regarding gull vision what about polarization given that sunlight is partially polarized um, reflection from water having some polarization capability in vision could enable birds to see prey short distances underwater like um, polarized sunglasses. And I'd imagine that would be similar for kingfishers or other, or, or you know, osprey and other things. Yeah, that's a great question. I actually don't know much about polariz or much at all about polarization in bird eyes, but I would assume that to be able to get at that, you would actually need to look at the lens and the cornea and the actual, um, the, the fluid in the eye to determine if uh, gulls have any of that polarization capability. I don't even actually know how polarization works um, and if there's any visual system that has polarization in the eyes. Great, we have other questions in the 
we don't have any in the Q and A, but we have more in the chat. <laughs> people, seem like, people seem to like using the chat now, probably because all of the the chats are now back. Um, ah. Oh yeah, I couldn't resist. Okay, don't make um, me mute mute you, Mark. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Susan and Frank ask, what visualization system do owls and nightbirds use? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that, well, I'm trying to think. I don't think for my analyses I have any owls and night jars currently, um, but I think it's been hypothesized that there might be a loss of SWS1 in those as well. Okay, thank you. Cool. Um, oh, Yvonne asks, yeah. can you say something about the super black color and which system it works in? This is for the birds of paradise. Yeah, um, so super black color is really, really interesting. I think it's, um, so Allison Schultz would know a lot more about this than I do. She's the curator at the Natural History Museum. Um, but to my knowledge, super black uh, feathers is uh, based on feather microstructure. And so in some way it's able to actually absorb a lot more wavelengths of light than just kind of your standard melanin pigment. Um, and so it's really, it's been found so far in a few birds of paradise and then also the Ramphacillus tanagers. Um, and often in the Ramphacillus tanagers, at least the the birds are having these super black patches that are close to kind of really brightly colored patches. And it's thought that it might be a way to kind of enhance the brightness of those patches. So like in the Ramphacillus fionagers, they, a lot of them have these really bright front patches and right next to it, they have these super black pigments to kind of, uh, or feathers to kind of enhance um, that brightness. Hmm. That's pretty cool. That's cool. Um, Great, thank you. Um, Yvonne asks, uh, do bowerbirds use UVS for the items they decorate their bower with? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I actually think that bowerbirds do have a UVS um, visual system. And depending on the item, I'm sure they use their UVS visual system for that. Um, as you know, they do put berries, but they also put, you know, things that humans leave lying around. So maybe some of those may not reflect in the UV, but I'm guessing that the actual natural things that they use do. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess the question is, what about diving birds? Ooh, like cormorants. cormorants. I don't currently have any cormorants in my analyses but I'm still continuing to add to those analyses. And so hopefully that will be um, next step on the docket. Mm -hmm. um, and great, Susan and Frank asked, oh, the, so the, the UV system varies by wavelength Do the other rod or other cone op, uh, options vary by wavelength sensitivity like the UV does. Yeah, there is some variation in the, the peak sensitivity of all of those um, cone types. But I think the unique thing about the UV system is that one, we know from the, the sequence, the DNA sequence, um, the sensitivity if it's within the UV and outside of the UV. Um, and I think also because a lot of the shifts in peak sensitivity for those kind of red, green, and blue cones don't, don't really shift it too much outside of the range of that color. Okay, fantastic. Um, and Lance mentions, um, as earlier mentioned that various vertebrates can see in the UV, so can some insects. Yeah. So I know insects yeah. are really cool too. I was mostly focusing on the vertebrate visual system, um, but it would be really interesting to look outside of that as well. Mm -hmm. And of course, insects can make some pretty incredible colors. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, we have a question in the Q and A. Yeah. Um, Britta <laughs> asks. I know none of them are in the Q and A until this one. So thank you, Britta. Uh, oh, this is interesting. Is there any correlation between high and low EV UV? and birds that strike windows? Mm, that's a great question. I don't actually know, um, but it would be something really interesting to look into. For the most part, I mean, a lot of window strike birds seem to be passerines, right? Kind of small passerines. And most 
passerines have that high UV as visual system, um, which is why I think the, you know, kind of the UV uh, stickers sometimes work on the windows. <laughs> mm -hmm. cool. And we have another question. Oh, no, uh, it's the same question. We have another oh, comment about insects, about bees can see in the UV. Um, mm, yeah. And actually a lot of the kind of research on um, UV coloration and visual system <laughs> has to do with flowers too, because um, a lot of flowers reflect UV as well. And mm. so for hummingbirds and as well as bees, you know, that could help them to find um, the, the nectar. Right, right. Cool. Um, Yvonne asks, um, is there UV in moonlight? Ooh, that's not a dumb question at all. I actually don't know if there's UV in moonlight. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Lance? <laughs> uh, th there might be a little bit, but we aren't really going to see it very much here on Earth because our atmosphere filters most of the UV out. Um, you know, that's why, for example, the Hubble Space mm -hmm. Telescope is above the atmosphere and not mm -hmm. on the ground. It's uh, yeah. to get it above the atmosphere so you, you don't have to contend with all the absorption at UV wavelengths. I mean, the amount of UV that gets down and, you know, gives people sunburns and so <clears> forth <throat> is a very small fraction of the of the UV that the sun actually produces. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> Ken asks, uh, would you care to comment on the possible visual system of dinosaurs? Ooh, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, yeah, well, we know that a lot of other vertebrates can see UV and that UV has kind of evolved multiple times across vertebrates. And we also are kind of learning more about coloration in dinosaurs. So it's definitely possible um, that they could potentially have seen UV as well. I don't know for sure, but um, it would definitely be something interesting to look into. Cool. Oh, so you have to come back sometime and give us a talk about coloration in dinosaurs. Then. Yeah. I know nothing about that. <laughs> I'll have to learn a lot. I might have to get another PhD first. <laughs> well, oh, we have um, another. We have a question from Lily. Uh, do birds like American goldfinches, which change plumages between breeding and non-breeding seasons, have different plumages because of diet changes? Uh, if they do change diets? Ooh, that's a really interesting question. And one that I don't know too much about, but I could see that being something really interesting to look into. Um, I wonder if there is, you know, if, if it's like a consequence or a result of them, you know, eating a different diet during the wintering season versus during the breeding season, or if it really has to do with them selecting um, what they're eating at different times of the year. Um, I also don't know how long um, carotenoids can actually be stored in their body. So I don't know if it's yeah. possible for them to, you know, have these reserves of carotenoids to save for when they're actually molting and producing new feathers. Hmm. Great. Fantastic. Um... Any more and questions? I'm not seeing any I, at the moment. I think that is it. Uh, Whitney, we'd like, again, thank you very much for presenting for us tonight. We really appreciate it. And I think everyone really enjoyed it. Thank uh, you next, so much for having yes, me. <laughs> thank you. Uh, next week, we uh, have Scott Pipkin uh, talking about birds and plants. Uh, it should be fascinating, especially to help uh, those help us identify what might have dove different driven doven whatever what may have <laughs> gone <laughs> gone underneath that plant and um, let's see something else popped up in the chat oh okay and we're okay on there and with that i want to thank everyone for joining us tonight and we will see everyone next week thank you again yeah, whitney. thank you everybody thank you whitney uh, thank, thank you. you, Whitney. Really great talk. Really enjoyed yes. it. Yeah, it's really fascinating it. stuff. Yeah. And we'll see everyone next week. Take care, everyone. Good night. Good night.